But thank you for the members. Um, when the children were reported to have been stuffed to death and buried in Shakahola, that was on 20th of March. The arrest took place two days later. Um, there could have been earlier reports to the police which were not acted on. And that is uh, part of the accountability uh, mechanisms that will be part of um, uh, the solution to the resolution of this matter. But immediate and, and at that point, Chair, I thank the NGOs, the society have done a good job, especially those who blew this thing and made it, uh, you know, a major issue initially and even after that. Uh, I just want to commend them. They did a great and patriotic work. Because it's one thing to sit here and blame judiciary, you blame police, you blame everybody except yourself. So there are many institutions and Kenyans who are not necessarily governments who have done a good job and I sing out the civil society. Uh, Aki Africa, Muhuri, and, and the others, they've done a good job. And even after that, they have remained active. They are partners with us in the accountability journey and the journey for justice. And you know, they would have easily said, it's not our work, we are not law enforcement officers. Why is this person coming to report? I don't want to get involved. And they go with other activities, so we must thank them. Same with our media. I think the media has done a brilliant, brilliant work. A matter as complex as this one would have been treated differently. Why not for the responsibility of our journalists, uh, both Kenyan journalists and international journalists who have been covering that uh, massacre in Shakahola. Again, I'm grateful to these non-governmental actors. I'm also grateful to the Red Cross and the other humanitarian organizations and private citizens. There are people who have given their money daily even to feed some of the officers in the operation. And I know a question was asked about funding. I'll respond to that. Private citizens, we honor them. And we'll find a way of recognizing them as part of closure. Quietly, without making a fuss about it, their job is to make sure there's water for the search and rescue teams, for the, you know all the teams there, the pathologists, providing them with soap, pocket money, supporting them with food where their budgets are restrained. So there are many heroes of this process. And also thank you, Senators, because you also took your time to visit there and see for yourself that situation there. It took about a month for us to start the operation because when the first crime was exposed, again because of the lapses which I have said had occurred on our part, yeah, we didn't know that what the situation is now is what it is that time until, you know, then another exposure mainly by NGOs, journalists, another exposure, then we realize, come on, this is much more serious. And that's when we see this is large-scale organized crime. And that, that took a bit of time for us to appreciate that we have just, through our uh, the support of the media and the journalists, that we've just stumbled on a monumental tragedy. We didn't expect because of the lapses which I have said before. And for the second time, if not the third, on behalf of the previous administration, where all these things began, by virtue of what I have already stated here, and the current administration, I apologize to the people of Kenya 
that this should not have happened. This is the worst security breach that our country has ever experienced. With regard to the ownership business, it, it's not even for, from a criminal justice perspective, we are not bothered with that discussion. That is a different discussion of who owns the land. And I don't want to preempt the prosecution case, but that should be the least of our worries. All we need to show is the suspect was in control of that space. That's all. Whether he had stolen it, whether he had uh, entered into an agreement with fraudsters, or it doesn't matter, but we must demonstrate that he's been the one who was calling the shots. And the people there is the one who was preaching to them. If we have the evidence to show is the one who was preaching to people there, indoctrinating them there, supervising the killers, that is enough. Doesn't matter whether he owned the land through a lease which is a legitimate lease or not, that is a different question altogether. Then thirdly, the issue of uh, mental health. All those like me who have been in that space for, for a long time, for three months now, almost every week, actually I'm returning there. And even much more, the officers who are there daily, they report there every day. At least me, I go once a week. I've been there eight times. They require support and chair I want to say this, I am very proud of our officers, both from government and non-governmental agencies, who are undertaking that work in Shakahola. They have surpassed our expectations. The focus, the patriotism is in another level. The empathy with the kind of work they are doing, they have taken it upon themselves that this is the most assigned, the most important assignment they are doing for this country. Some under very difficult circumstances. You can imagine people reporting to grave sites and mortuaries every day for three months. Exhume every day, children, women, old people, men. So we have a plan. We have a plan. There is an ongoing social, psychosocial support system. But even the group that will require strong de socialization are the grave diggers, the boys, the young men who are doing this work. Again, they have done a good job, a great job. But that trauma, if it's not managed, can even be a future of security problem. Because every day they wake up to dig graves. So you don't know where that work ends, what else they'll do. So we have a plan. We have an exit strategy, which I don't want to preempt. But we'll honor those young men and we'll give them a uh, transition into something else um, and absorb some of them into some of our 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 systems and, and make sure that they we don't withdraw them from that activity and release them back to society in their state. So we have a psycho social psychosocial support system for everybody, all of us uh, who have uh, been there uh, will tell you it's not an easy thing. Some of the bodies are badly damaged, um, and so forth and so on. Um, so, um, let me give this assurance here. Yeah. Let not the country worry about whether the officers, the public officers who cost or contributed in any way to this tragedy will be held into account. Let there be no worry, because they will.
but we are limited in terms of how fast they can act. One, we are limited by the law. We are limited by our own constitution on the presumption of innocence. Number two, we are limited by our own constitution, Article 47, on fair administrative action. You don't wake up and just interdict and whatever. Otherwise, they'll go to court, and you know our courts now have achieved uh, another level of uh, freedom. They can do anything. Um, and I'm not uh, commenting on anything that is life. But uh, yes, that is our law, that is our country, that is our judiciary. So we have to be careful, but take it from me. Every officer of whatever agency who has a role in this through action or inaction, conduct or misconduct, will be brought to justice without exception. And we are not going to look for junior people to hold accountable we will hold everyone accountable. Whether they will be serving in office at that time, or they will have left office. That is how we view this accountability journey. Then there was the issue of um, this freedom. Um, how far, you know, you know, when we say, uh, how far should it go? It should go as far as uh, the law is not broken, as far as the rights of other people are not affected. That is our Bill of Rights. These freedoms are not limitless. Limitle limitless. In fact, your freedom to punch in the air ends where my nose starts. Your freedom to punch in the air aimlessly ends where my nose starts. That is the fundamental underlying philosophy of human rights. In this country, we have somehow cultured ourselves erroneously that freedoms are limitless. And we have, in the process, generated three forms of extremism. One, religious extremism. And you touch anything religion, and everybody says, no, 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 this is freedom of worship. No freedom of worship? Does it include the freedom to kill and torture? No. Then you have cultural ex extremism. Some people hiding around culture to violate the rights of other people, like those who are mutilating our girls and cutting their body parts. And they say, oh, it's our culture. That's all. Then they expose to, the, to them to grave health hazards for life. Then the third and final category is political extremism. Yes. Oh, we have political rights, we have democracy, we can do what we want. We have a freedom to assemble and demonstrate. It's true. Yeah, but don't, don't just go f to a meeting and, and do your meeting and talk. And if your government promotes the policies of government in your meeting, if you're in the opposition, promote the opposition policies in the meeting. When the meeting is over, go home. Simple. The fact that you have a right to present a petition doesn't mean you have a right to ask uh, 50,000 people to storm a street or a town or, uh, you know, just close a road and people cannot uh, travel. And, and this is, uh, which constitution is that? These are the ingredients that erode our constitutional order. That's how you destroy a country, slowly. Oh, I'm a preacher of the gospel, don't touch me. You're killing people. I'm a politician, I have a freedom to do whatever I want, let people demonstrate. And as early as 6 a.m., before even the meeting is called, is called, people are looting other people's shops, criminals who are taking advantage of your meeting anyway. So uh, that's where we are. Our 
challenge is to strike a balance between the need to respect all the freedoms that our country through the constitution has offered, but also respect the limitations that ensure public order, public safety, public morality. And that's where we are coming from. So all extremists of all types will be treated the same way because they, what they are causing is the same thing. Mr. Mackenzie has, uh, through his activities, uh, killed uh, the hundreds. Uh, other extremists are causing deaths of uh, maybe a lesser number, but they are still deaths of the people of Kenya. It must stop. And I mean it, Mr. Chair, it must stop. Um, then there was the question of um, the experience you had in Kisumu. There are so many, I have reports, very many reports, because the question was from Senator Amida was, at what point should security agencies get involved? It's a bit difficult. Let me tell you why, Chair. Because I've taken time to reflect on some of these matters. I'm not just speaking out of the blues. I've taken a lot of time. You know, public officials, including judges, members of parliament, and security officers, are also human beings. And they also worship. Some of them are members of some of the organizations that we think are criminal organizations. So that answers some of the questions you have. It's a much bigger problem than we are thinking. And the reverence we have given this space is so high, you know, when already a, a security officer, a minister like myself, a, name, a senator like yourself, you're already a member of this organization that is perpetuating this. Tell me how easy it will be to be able to rely on you to address this issue. Let me give this assurance also. All criminals who are hiding in religion, in culture, in politics, we will stop them before they hurt us more. And we have no apologies to make to anybody. We'll stop them. Including members of the judiciary. Because they are also human beings. So any person involved in crime, it doesn't matter. Because your independence, your the space we have given you is not to commit crime. We'll come for you. Um, the source of funds, we have made a lot of progress on that area. Allow me not to say much more than that, but we have made a lot of progress and I thank the Senator for raising that issue. It was an important um, element of a successful prosecution and the realization of justice. Uh, did he have a militia? Yes. All the evidence is pointing to the existence of a militia whose work was to supervise death, make sure that those who change their minds are forced to continue with that process till the end. With tremendous respect, my distinguished professional senior, Senator Faki, the Senator of Mombasa, is wrong. To say that the he has this hypothesis that this is a conman who had stolen people's property, and when he asked questions, um, he wanted to get rid of them. No, <coughs> this is a criminal who. In collaboration with his uh, supporters 
and those who assisted him commit this offense, deliberately sat down and designed a well and carefully planned program to kill the people of Kenya using force and dangerous doctrine, period. If it was the economic issues, he would have dealt with the people buying land, and mainly it is men who buy land. Then when they disagree, he would kill the man. But to seduce a whole family to go and stay with him for months and kill the entire family, if it was a land transaction, he would have dealt with people who are speculation for land, and then it ends there. But the, what we are having there is it will actually is a, is a complete elimination of his followers. As a religious group, members of GNI were targeted for complete elimination in the entire uh, uh, setup, the entire family. So I disagree. However, notwithstanding that, we are not ruling out any possibility. Even that aspect, we have not ruled out that there could be land and economic issues involved in our investigation, because it will be foolhardy to do so. With regard to the chairman's um, uh, proposal, the chairman of this committee, on uh, what the civil society has recommended, I don't want to venture there because of the controversies around suicide and uh, I have my personal views but I don't think it's, it's necessary at this stage to to share them but it's very a very controversial matter it's not as easy as the civil society organizations want us to believe because within the human rights jurisprudence what we have in human rights jurisprudence under international law and our constitution is the protection of the right to life. And in fact, it is that protection of the right to life that has led to the abolition of death penalty in Kenya and in other jurisdictions. That because of the sanctity, that the death penalty is an affront on the right to life because you're killing someone for whatever reason. They say it's an affront of the right to life. So the right to life, God gives lives, takes life. That is uh, some of the jurisprudence that has been obtaining. But I know in some countries, and uh, this is now what I'm seeing creeping into our Kenyan jurisdiction, is the jurisprudence of the right to die which has been there in European countries and other Western countries for the last 20 years. And the argument is, a Chair, that as a human being, because I am a, a human being enjoys that, that fundamental and existential freedom, and I have the right to live, I also have the right to die. So if I want to take my life, why should, we gov why should government be bothered to force me to live? That is the philosophy that has led to some countries, like the, the, like the Netherlands, just as a way of example, to have laws on euthanasia, for example, or mass killing, what is known as mass killing, where somebody can be killed on medical grounds. And in between that human rights jurisprudence and philosophy, there is religious issues there. So I don't want to venture there. I'll get lost. <laughs> I will get lost so that uh, uh, whether or not a person has both the right to, to live and the right to die, I am not sure. But as to the right to life, that one I am sure because it is universal, that it is one of the fundamental rights and freedoms of the individual. Very quickly, the funding, it is true, some of the teams we have, 
supporting this operation are underfunded. But the problem is with the parent, you know, the, I mean, because this is multi agency. So you have the police part, which is an interior function. You have the pathologist, which is a Ministry of Health function. The government chemist is interior. You have others like children welfare, which is, uh, I think, social services. So it depends now on the, the parent ministry. For us in interior, we are making sure that all our teams there are funded. We have had to ask our county officers to reallocate funds because this is a national emergency and the quest for justice is extremely important for it to succeed. And we are there to support the teams every day. So the discrepancies are caused by uh, the fact that uh, it's beyond the Ministry of Interior. Uh, some of those agencies fall under other ministries. Um, the allegation that uh, the government is, uh, could be schooled or the country could be schooled in favor of the Christian faith at the expense of uh, the Muslim faith is not true. When whatever measures were done, when we had a real problem with some criminals hiding in uh, madrasas and mosques, propagating dangerous doctrine and encouraging terror, we were very vicious and we succeeded. Because the problem, the threat there then was being posed from that section of faith. Today, this threat has come from the Christian faith. So, that's why I've repeated many times, this delivery chair, that ruthlessness, ruthlessness that we applied that time to deal with our Muslim brothers that time, we will use it on our Christian brothers and sisters, the same. So that also we tackle elements within Christianity who are causing the same harm as our brothers uh, in the Muslim faith that time. And I agree, we should also look also at other faiths and also persons of neutral faith. Mm. 